Welcome back to KOAN Hot Talk, 1080 AM, 95.1 FM, The Joe Miller Show. Blessed to have with us Herb Titus, constitutional attorney. You can find out about him at lawandfreedom.com. But Mr. Titus has written numerous articles, books, chapters, studies on constitutional law. He's also the author of God, Man, and Law, a widely acclaimed text on American common law. And you can also go to www.herbtitus.com to learn more. But I think that his greatest accomplishment is his marriage of 52 years. Uh, they have He and his wife, Marilyn, have four children and 15 grandchildren. Congratulations, Herb. And welcome to the show. Joe, it's nice to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. So from time to time, I consult with you and your partner about the issues that are on the edge of American law. We've got a lot of bad decisions coming down from the federal courts. I want you to talk a little bit later about Roy Moore. Apparently, you are involved with him, at least in one case right now. And you also apparently were involved with Justice Moore during the Ten Commandments case a few years back. But first, I want to talk about Second Amendment issues, if you're okay with that. You represent Larry Pratt and the Gun Owners of America, or at least have involvement with that organization, right? Yes, we do, and we also work with the National Gun Rights Association out in Colorado, where we're helping uh, the citizens of Colorado to turn back those draconian uh, <clears throat> gun laws that were passed, uh, gosh, what was it, four years ago or something like that. Right, so where are you at with that? Uh, particular agenda, we're, making any headway we're in the at all? Process, we're in the process of uh, getting a, our brief done on appeal. Uh, we are one lawsuit uh, that uh, has been made in response to those laws, uh, and our claims are based entirely upon the state constitution. There's another lawsuit that's pending in the federal courts that uh, depends upon the Second Amendment itself. But the uh, Second Amendment in the Colorado State Constitution is a little bit different from the one in the United States Constitution, and hopefully it's going to be a greater barrier to gun control laws than the Second Amendment has been in the hands of judges across the country who don't really believe uh, in uh, Second Amendment rights. But it amazes me that you could have a state that passes out these draconian laws, and then yeah, two of the ringleaders end up getting recalled, and yet the laws still stay on the books. You would think that the legislature would have gotten the message. Well, you know, this is one of the problems with the conservative movement, is they always conserve the last liberal victory. And so <laughs> we're, we're faced with an unending um, slide, uh, and we wonder why we can't get back to where we ought to be, uh, uh, you know, back in the... 20 or 30 years ago but you just have to keep standing and you just have to keep trying and who knows god may break through and give us a victory or two well it looks pretty dismal out there i, I mean i you know the reason i'm engaged in this is to try to help everybody get the truth so that we can act accordingly and i think there are wonderful voices out there that are expanding their reach i think that's key hopefully god still does have time for this country and will take the action i we just put up a story Oh, last week about some of the things that are happening internationally in Nigeria, for example. There's a massive revival going on there. But I want to talk to you more specifically about the Second Amendment at the federal level. Now, you're a Harvard law grad. I won't hold that against you. Everything uh, I know about law, I didn't learn at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> I say the same thing about Yale Law School. I mean, if you want to learn how to practice law, certainly don't go to one of the Ivy League schools. Isn't and if you really truth? want to know about the Constitution, don't go there either because they aren't going to teach it the way it should be. In fact, you won't even read the document, much less learn anything that's true about it. <laughs> that's pretty accurate. But, you know, one of the things that I've heard, and we had Stephen Crowder on, he's a, a conservative comedian, that put out a video about, you know, what the founders intended with respect to the Second Amendment. And in the video, he shows a number of guns that existed at the time that the Second Amendment was drafted, repeating percussion rifles, you know, pistols that had, you know, 23 barrels or something like that, but guns <laughs> that were capable of rapid fire. You know, the private license to ships to go out with cannon that were owned privately. They weren't controlled by the government. And he said, look, you know, the founders understood at the time they passed out the Second Amendment that there weren't supposed to be the type of limitations that are imposed by the federal courts. And yet you told me in an earlier conversation today that apparently the feds are trying to restrict now armor-piercing ammo. What's going on with that? Well, it's a typical gun control law in which what they do is they come up with new rules that either – make it your firepower so it's less or, or your uh, uh, firearm that's less safe or something like that. And, and, and really what it does is it always, uh, it, it always hurts the person who obeys the law. And so 
uh, gun control really doesn't do any good with regard to those people who abuse and who misuse uh, firearms. It always comes back on top of people who are uh, quite adept at uh, the use of firearms and well-trained and well-intentioned. So is there any chance that the feds are going to be successful at this limitation on the armor-piercing ammo? Where is it at? Well, the problem is that it's before the ATF, and, and uh, the ATF is making its own regulations, and there's time for comment. And they usually get lots of different comments from uh, people. But uh, if you get this far into the process, they're just going through the motions, and it looks like we're going to get some more restrictions on, uh, on ammo. Uh, so and, of it, course, go ahead. Is this going to be grandfathered in, or is the regulation written that those that are in possession of armor piercing must dispose it, of it'll the It'll probably uh, bullets? get grandfathered in like the magazine limitations are in Colorado. And, of course, nobody knows exactly what those limitations are when it comes to, you know, the n- number of rounds you can put in a magazine. So uh, don't be surprised if uh, there is a... Uh, a rule that comes down, and yet at the same time, what's always interesting to me are people who manufacture firearms, manufacture uh, ammunition. They always find a way, and once again, the ATF will have to come up with some new scheme in order to take our rights away. So tell me, I mean, what in the world should an average everyday American do, or what can they do in hunting and sporting purposes with armored piercing bullets? Why should we have the right to have those, Herb? Well, because the the Second Amendment wasn't designed just for people to go out and shoot deer or shoot uh, a bear. They're designed for the purpose of uh, shooting the tyrant. And that's the political uh, truth, and it's the political foundation upon which the Second Amendment was uh, passed. Uh, And, you know, I was reading in the Scripture the other day what happened, you know, when Saul first became king, is they didn't have any weapons. All they could use were garden implements, and those they didn't even have a smith. Uh, to sharpen them up. And, of course, what was it? Uh, They were in bondage to the Philistines. So that's exactly what has happened throughout history, uh, and we're not immune from that. So where does it stop? We get the armor-piercing ammo. We get the hand grenades, the bazookas. Is there any limitation that should be imposed? Well, I don't believe so uh, because I think that our our founders understood the purpose of uh, weaponry, And I think that if the weaponry was more available, I think there would be a lot more responsible use of it. People would uh, work together in the open. I think that's one of the problems. It's like what happened in New Jersey just a couple, three days ago. A man buys an antique firearm and he puts it in his uh, his, uh, jockey box uh, inside a blanket and and is uh, caught with speeding. And, of course, you know, he's a law-abiding guy. He says, well, I've got a a, a firearm in the car. Uh, which everybody's supposed to do, uh, and he's arrested, and uh, he faces a three and a half year minimum sentence. And it's just, a, I mean, and this is so typical, Joe. Yeah. It really is, uh, and I really believe that what we've got is a totally naive uh, judiciary. They don't know what firearms are about. They've never fired anything themselves, uh, and they've forgotten really uh, the history that led our founders to make that the Second Amendment. It's not and the you know, Amendment, it's the Second Amendment. And, and when you hear people talk about the reason behind the Second Amendment, and you say, hey, it's there to shoot tyrants, <laughs> the reaction that you get from you know, the <laughs> mainstream is, what kind of radical are you? Well, my yeah. turn back to them is, what kind of radicals were the founders? Well, precisely, and they weren't going to let the king and the parliament run over them, and the only way that they could do that is to be well-armed. As a matter of fact, as you well know, It was because the king and and, uh, his uh, military that tried to take away the people's firearms had got people fired up and said, no way. That's right. Well, hey, we're going to have you for the next segment, if you'll stay with us. Fourth Amendment decisions coming down the pike. I know you guys at your firm have done wonderful things with respect to GPS tracking. You told me a little bit about some decisions that are coming down on the federal side on the guest registry that the feds think that they have access to without any type of search warrant. One of the things that really concerns me that I'd like you to comment a little bit on is how the feds believe that they don't need any type of judicial authorization to go after things that you store on the cloud. That would include email on Gmail. It would include your contact list. And now pretty much everything, because 
<laughs> you know, even some of the smart TVs today are picking up through microphones everything that's going on in the home. Where does that information go? It goes into the cloud. We now have a number of federal courts that have decided there's no expectation of privacy. The feds have access to it. And the question is, where does it end? At any point, are we ever going to get our privacy back? I have real concerns about where the nation's headed. Herb, you're on the cutting edge of this. Love to hear your thoughts on it and where the country needs to go in order to get rein in this out-of-control judiciary. Look forward to the next segment with Herb Titus. Stay with us. The Joe Miller Show. Welcome back to KOAN Hot Talk 1080 AM, 95.1 FM, The Joe Miller Show. We're fortunate to have with us Herb Titus, constitutional attorney, talking to us about issues facing our country at the federal level primarily. Talked a little bit about what's going on in Colorado, though, too. Mr. Titus is a Harvard graduate. Again, we won't hold that against him. He's also a constitutional law attorney that's litigated a number of cases. But in addition to him, I guess you served as a trial attorney and a special assistant U.S. attorney some years ago. Uh, so you kind of know what's going on on the other side to a certain extent, right? It's just as corrupt today as it was then. Back in the <laughs> 1960s, I just, I just got out of law school and and I was working on an organized crime and racketeering. That was when Bobby Kennedy was attorney general. Tells you how old I am. Anyway, uh, I was working on this investigation out in Kansas City, and the U.S. attorney uh, looked at me and said, hey, let's go see the judge. So wow. I found out very soon that there was a secret passageway from the U.S. attorney's office to the chief judge's office that no one would know if you were using it so you could go up and down it freely. Incredible. I really got an ear- I really got an eyeful. I couldn't believe it. You know, this is interesting, Herb, because I just talked, this was within, well, I talked to the son of an attorney that was involved in this case, but I talked to the defendant in a case in Alaska from 30 years ago or so who told me about the exact same thing, that in his particular case, secret passageway, discussion with a judge, I, you know. I was U.S. magistrate judge for a period of time. Never had anything like that happen. Never had anybody even think about asking me to do anything in exchange or outside of, of course, the evidence and the law that's applied in the courtroom or appropriately applied, you know, in chambers when writing decisions. Even well, as a state a judge crash, never saw it. Yeah, I had a crash course in, in learning about uh, corruption because the other thing that happened to us is that I was suspicious that the FBI was using an illegal wiretap in this investigation that I confronted a couple of agents about it. I said, you have to be using an illegal wiretap. And they would say, no, no, no. And they persisted on saying no. And then two days before trial, when two of them had to be witnesses in a case that I had, they came to and said, oh, we can't take the stand. I said, why not? And they said, well, you'll have to talk to Washington. Well, I found out in Washington, well, no, they didn't wiretap. What they did is they made trouble on their telephone line, sent a lineman out with an FBI agent and planted a mic in the person's uh, room. Wow. And never told us. We were the attorneys who were responsible for prosecution, and these people were illegally gathering evidence and lying to us. Unbelievable. Well, the government doesn't ever lie, do they? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) that was 19... That was 1963, 1964. I mean, that's over 50 years ago. Right, something like that decades ago, but it looks like they've learned from the past. They're continuing it in the future because there's no accountability. Is that your take on it? That's exactly correct. They get yes. away with it, and as a matter of fact, it's worse today, and we were going to talk about the Fourth Amendment and, and uh, search and seizure. It used to be the rule. This was back in the 1960s. The rule was this. If the government didn't have a superior property interest in what they were searching for, they had no right, even if they had probable cause and a warrant. They could not go search and seize a piece of personal property unless they had a superior property interest. So explain that so our listeners can understand. Not all of us have gone to Harvard and Yale. So what does that mean in plain jargon? Well, today most people think of searches, FBI searches, for evidence. They're looking for evidence. It used to be the rule is you could not just look for evidence. You had to show that what you were looking for was contraband, something you couldn't own, or an instrumentality of the crime, something that you misused in, a, in the crime, or a fruit of the crime, because you didn't have any property interest in that. Right. But if all, all they're looking for is your shirt and your coat and your tie in order to convict you, they couldn't do that, even if they had probable cause and a warrant. 
So that's a major expansion. It's a major infringement on the Fourth Amendment. Of course, the, the feds have been pushing in other ways, too. I know that your firm, and I helped out with this, filed an amicus brief on GPS tracking. That actually turned out for the good, right? Well, it did because they finally went back to the first things. They went back and said, hey, the Fourth Amendment protects persons and houses and papers and effects. And the one thing about person is that you have a property interest in your own person. Once you understand that primary principle, then intangibles, information, all of that is protected by the Fourth Amendment. But it isn't protected today because under the technology that we're living in, almost nothing is private. And if all the Fourth Amendment does is protect the reasonable expectation of privacy, we have only unreasonable expectations of privacy, never a reasonable uh, uh, protection of privacy. So, and that's really where we're at now, right? I mean, you yeah. talked about this guest registry issue. Tell our listeners a little bit about this and why it troubles you. Well, the Los Angeles City Ordinance requires the motels to uh, gather extensive evidence or uh, information about their guests. And then they have a provision that says if a police officer, only one police officer, walks into the motel and wants to look at the guest register, doesn't have a uh, probable cause, doesn't even have reasonable suspicion, and certainly doesn't have a warrant, you have to show him the guest register. Why? Well, well, because the hotel doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Well, of course they don't, because why would Los Angeles want to give them such an expectation of privacy? <laughs> but if it's a property interest then the government would have to show that they have a superior property right in that information that's in the guest registry, or otherwise they have no business searching for it. And, of course, they don't have that. Yeah, the only reason why we have the extensive taxing system today is because the uh, IRS can come out and search all your paper. So and it used so, to be they couldn't do that. So are there any because, federal courts that have actually agreed with the original interpretation with essentially a rollback, or are they all following precedent and you're GPS hoping to get this reversed at the appellate level? on that path. The GPS state pay started us on that path because there they put a GPS on a vehicle and drove the vehic- and the, uh, the defendant drove his vehicle on public highways, and they said, well, you don't have any reasonable expectation of privacy as to where you were going because you're on a public highway. And the United States Supreme Court said, hey, no, wait a minute. Putting the GPS device on the car, is the installation of it is a, uh unreasonable search and seizure. Why? Because you're trespassing on the guy's property. That's why. Right, right. And we thought, hey, this is going to be a new era because once you put the property principle back into effect, then the court doesn't have this manipulable, reasonable expectation of privacy to come up with whatever result they want to come up with. And what happens is that litigants don't even raise the property issue, and uh, even though they're invited to do so, and even they're told that the property principle is a baseline by which everything is measured. So the lawyers don't even know what's going on. The defense right. bar doesn't know what's going on. Right. So, much less the judges. So tell me what, as far as, and this is something that has been a major concern to me, and of course it relates to what you're talking about, the fact that virtually everything that we do, at least in my generation and earlier generations, we do everything on computer. You know, all of our contact lists yeah. are there. All of our communication is there. Right. And many of us are now communicating you know, via the Internet lines as far as it, not just Skype, but also the other methodology that you have to communicate online. You know, virtually everything that you write, many people are right. now turning to cloud-based yeah. process servers. Yeah, uh, and, so, who, and who owns that? Who owns all of that? You do. It's all your property. Yeah, it's your property, and you should be able to protect it against any kind of a search or seizure. I don't care how my how much probable cause that the government has, but they don't work that way. They say, oh, well, uh, as long as we're not intruding upon your privacy, then it's okay. Sure. So they go to you know, the storage facility, whoever it is, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. Yeah. They can get all that information, no warrant required, and virtually everything that you do can be basically reviewed, even avoiding the discussion about whether or not the feds are recording your calls. You don't even have to go there. We already know that the law, at least as it's currently interpreted, yeah. protects well, the federal government in looking at, ba- at basically everything that you do via the cloud. Is that your interpretation? Pretty much. Pretty That's much. a scary thing. That's a scary it thing. Is. You know, we've gone a little bit long on this topic, but I want to hold you over to talk about Roy Moore because you're involved not just in the current case, but we're also involved in the Ten Commandments case. We'll have about 10 minutes after the break. Would you stay with us? Sure will. I appreciate it, Herb. Back with you in just a few, The Joe Miller Show. 
Welcome back to KON 1080 AM, 95.1 FM, Hot Talk, the Joe Miller Show. We have with us Herb Titus, constitutional attorney, constitutional law attorney. Uh, Herb, you and I were talking during the break about some of the positives. I mean, we don't get to talk about that very often because there are not many <laughs> positive developments in the judiciary. But with respect to Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, how do you see the court lining up? Well, it's interesting because one of the uh, appointees that we vigorously oppose uh, that Barack Obama nominated was uh, Sotomayor. Uh, and it turns out that she's more sensitive to the issues on the Fourth Amendment than even people like Scalia and Thomas. And so what we've got here is a new lineup with Scalia, Thomas from the, quote, conservative uh, wing, and Kagan, Ginsburg, and Sotomayor, the three lady justices, uh, joining together in a case recently where they said that uh, bringing a dog sniffing or I mean a drug sniffing dog onto your property and having him nose around was an unconstitutional search because uh, it was crossing your curtilage your property line um, and as a matter of fact Sotomayor was saying we've got to go back and re-examine some of these cases where we have uh, allowed the government to uh, conduct searches where uh, we found there was no reasonable expectation of privacy so uh, did she write a majority uh, opinion on that thing. What's that? Did she author the majority opinion on that decision? No, but she uh, authored a concurring opinion, which was very interesting, uh, that she affirmed the majority very strongly and then went further and said, you know, we've got to reexamine some of our cases in this area. So uh, we're looking forward to someone finally breaking this open. And this is why we're we're thinking that this uh, guest register case may very well be uh, a case which will be a landmark. Very good news. Uh, let's turn to another topic related, of course, judiciary. Again, Roy Moore, you represented Justice Moore in the Ten Commandments case. He's back in the news again with respect to the gay marriage decision that issued by the federal district judge in Alabama. Roy Moore ordered his probate judges to not implement that decision, in part because it wasn't directed at the probate judges. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background about your involvement in the current uh, controversy, as well as why Judge Moore is right? Well, that's the point, is that Judge Moore is right, and he was so right that that's what got the uh, the district court, uh, the federal district court, uh, in trouble, uh, because uh, she found out that the very person who should have been the party to the case, the probate judge, was one that she'd kicked out of the case because she wanted the attorney general to be the defendant, the party defendant in the case, because if she got the attorney general as the the uh, de- party defendant, then her order would be statewide. If it was just <laughs> with a probate judge, it would only be in one of, you know, what, 70 or 80 counties. That is hilarious. So she, you were telling me during the break that she actually reached back and made the probate judge a party again. Is that right? That's right. And that way she was able to uh, at least get uh, the probate judges uh, under her wing, uh, which, which, of course... <laughs> If it hadn't been for Chief Justice Moore, she would have just gone ahead, and who knows what the attorney general would have done. What's been happening in this area of same-sex marriage is, is uh, really atrocious because we've got judges falling all over themselves to find a constitutional right to same-sex marriage, and you ask them, well, where is that in the Constitution? What language is it? Oh, it's in the Due Process Clause. Oh, well, no, it's in the Equal Protection Clause. Well, well it's somewhere in there. Uh, we just don't know exactly where it is, but uh, we know it's there. And it's subverting in every one of these cases the democratic preference of the people within the states in which their will, basically, their statutes, sometimes their constitutional amendments, are being set aside by the federal judiciary. It just amazes me, her with the rapidity, well, how rapid this change has occurred and how quickly these federal judges have jumped on this bandwagon. I've never seen anything like it in the well, 20 years that I've practiced law. It's a manufactured popularity poll. You know, people are saying, oh, well, now the whole, you know, all Americans are going in a certain direction. Well, this, all of this is manufactured. It doesn't have anything to do with reality. And, and I think a lot of it is people are just tired of it. They're tired of these people coming along. And this, of course, the problem with the whole homosexual rights movement is that uh, they keep coming for for this. I remember back in the 1960s, they said, all we want is decriminalization. Just don't make it a crime. And then, oh, well, we don't want this. Well, we don't want that. And pretty soon they're at your foot, your your door and saying, we want you to, to, to sell us a cake on our terms and force you uh, 
uh, to hold uh, their view into, you know, in a high regard. So Right, and you're talking about the Oregon Baker case where yeah. they actually, the, the bakery, a Christian-owned bakery, refused to bake a homosexual-themed cake and, of course, was then pursued an administrative law judge recently issued a decision. There's been extreme, and, of course, it was against the bakery, extreme financial cost, uh, my understanding is, in addition to the loss of the business, may, they may actually fi- face fines exceeding and legal costs exceeding $100,000. And no one knows what, what's coming next. I mean, we don't know what's coming next. Uh, they're, they're, they will not be satisfied with the gains. They will not be satisfied with, no, with uh, same-sex marriage. It's not going to um, meet what they are looking for, uh, so be prepared. Well, you know, her, all I, businesses are basically going to be at their mercy. Now, of course, th- this is just going to be limited to same-sex marriage, though, right? I mean, th- th- this doesn't have any <laughs> chance to go further beyond that, does it? No, but, well, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really true. And the one thing that really disturbs me about this is the federal judiciary. You know, we're told that uh, judges get lifetime appointments. Well, there's no such thing in the Article Three of the Constitution. Uh, it, they're appointed during good behavior. There's a good behavior standard that has never been applied, and, you know, that's to Congress's detriment. They've never uh, taken the effort to have an outside uh, organization or outside agency to examine uh, the federal judiciary. There is a way to file a judicial misconduct uh, complaint with the feds, but guess where it goes? It goes to a bunch of judges. Uh, and judges aren't going to judge themselves impartially. They're going to be very partial. You have to have an independent uh, commission to do something like that. So uh, we have a constitution that says they serve only during good behavior. But as a matter of fact, it's a lifetime appointment. And so they're not responsible uh, or responsive, I should say, to any constituency because they're not elected. They're just appointed. And once they get on the bench, they do whatever they want to. As a matter of fact, that judge in Alabama was Jeff Sessions. Senator Jeff Sessions, uh, special appointee to the bench down in southern Alabama. And she was supposed to be the conservative's conservative. And she was so quick to get on the sodomite bandwagon and blow out a decision of about 12 pages and uh, upset 81 percent of the uh, people of Alabama who had voted in favor of the Marriage Sanctity Act. Yeah, and it's amazing to me, too, to look at, you know, this is a state, I think it's in the top three states for, you know, favoring traditional marriage. It's just an in-your-face type decision, and I would imagine that there's extreme popular opposition to what's going on down there. And and I, I don't expect you to know necessarily what's going on the ground there, but I would assume that Justice Moore has quite a bit of support amongst the residents of Alabama for a stand. Yeah, it's really true. Of course, a lot of that support is silent, and some people just, you know, don't want to be bothered. They don't want to get in the middle of it. Uh, and so, to a certain extent, it's it really is a silent mega majority. Really, what you have. So uh, getting, and I getting, think that people people are finally sick of it, and they think it'll finally go away, and they won't have to deal with it anymore. I mean, when you think to, about it, Joe, there's very few people who get married. Right. You know, we had a guest on several days ago from Quebec, and he said nobody marries in Quebec, and he said that's coming to the United States despite all the negatives that are associated with it. We put up a story about all the ills of cohabitation prior to marriage. People don't seem much to care. We don't value it as a society. We create all sorts of equal contracts that end up basically tearing down that foundational institution that's so important to a healthy society. I wanted to get back to reigning in the judiciary, and we just have a couple of minutes left. But it appears to me that you pointed out what the Constitution provides for good behavior. Very insightful. Would love to see that come out practically where you would actually have an agency or some sort of uh, entity that has oversight, popular oversight, that could apply that. Right now it appears, though, the only option we have is impeachment, and that rarely happens. I think we had Hastings out of Florida, and now, of course, now he's a congressman. (laughs) But (laughs) it seems that the Congress is very apprehensive about applying it, but, but it is an area where you could pressure your elected representatives to push in, because once you start impeaching judges that act outside of the original construct of the Constitution, won't all the rest line up? Well, and uh, and impeachment certainly is uh, a remedy that's available. And the difficulty, of course, is moving the monolith in Washington, D.C., because they're so concerned about the next uh, election. Uh, 
uh, and so concerned about what the uh, media is saying about them that they simply hide uh, when you come around and, and bring them uh, matters that are going to put them into the limelight and have to defend themselves. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a tool that is useful and helpful, but it takes courageous people to use it. Well, Herb, I really appreciate you being with us. We didn't reach Obamacare. We're going to have to have you on again sometime. Very insightful. Appreciate everything that your firm is doing on the cause of liberty. You've been a warrior in that area. Certainly somebody that can direct us as to where we ought to go and the legal morass that we find ourselves in so often. Thank you so much for your insights. I look forward to having you on again. It was a pleasure, Joe. Thank you.